Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including David Mosher, Logan Larson, and Mike Akins. Coming up on DTNS, why Patreon firing its security team is bad for different reasons than you think. United Airlines down, uh, doubles down on flying taxis and how to stop doom scrolling. Stop, stop. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, September 9th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm today's producer, Anthony Lemos. Uh, A.K.A. Amos. If you've, you've heard to talk about Amos before, that's same guy. I, I promised some people that I would I would clarify next time I was on the show. So good, good. <laughs> I'm glad we've uh, we've put that controversy behind us finally. <laughs> All right, let's start with a few tech things you should know. U.S. Senator Marco Rubio and Representative Michael McCall warned that Apple should not use. China's Yangtze Memory Technologies Company, or YMTC, to supply flash memory chips for its smartphones. Apple told the Financial Times that it has not used YMTC chips in its products, but has been evaluating them for use only in iPhones sold in China. YMTC is under investigation for supplying chips made with U.S. technology to Huawei, which would be in violation of U.S. licensing rules. YMTC has not been added to the entity list that Huawei has, though. The U.S., though, is concerned that China is subsidizing YMTC in an attempt to dominate the market and that even working with Apple inside China could help YMTC gain knowledge to further that goal. Meta has disbanded its responsible innovation team, which helped identify and avoid downsized new products. Meta told the Wall Street Journal that the company remains committed to the team's goals, but believes the two dozen engineers and ethicists are better used on issue-specific teams as compared to centralized catch-all groups. Intel published specifications for its Arc A series of discrete desktop GPUs. Uh, the top of the line, Arc A770, is going to feature 32 XE cores and up to 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory, peak bandwidth of 560 gigabits per second. The A750 will offer 28 XE cores, while the A580 will offer 24 XE cores. Both have 8 gigabytes of GDDR6 and 512 gigabytes per second bandwidth. These will join the entry level A380. That one's already on the market. We don't got any word on price or availability for any of these new cards, but it is nice to have the details. Instagram confirmed it will test reposting content in a user's main feed with a small group of users, similar to resharing stories. Social media consultant Matt Navarro posted a screenshot showing a repost tab on users' profiles. I would like that. I've so never really I. cared about an edit button on Twitter, but I've always wanted this. So I hope that that pans out. Uh, and finally, India's finance ministry said the Reserve Bank of India will prepare an approved list of legal loan apps that will be allowed on app stores in the country. The ministry is also going to review and cancel licenses of non-banking financial institutions if they are found not monitoring for money laundering. Uh, Dan Campos talked about these shady loan apps uh, being a problem in Mexico. They're a problem in India as well. Uh, and that's what India is doing to crack down on them. All right, let's talk a little bit about what's going on at Patreon. A bunch of people pinged us about this, obviously, because we are supported by Patreon. We've been on Patreon since almost the beginning of Patreon. Uh, here's what happened. A lawyer at Crypto and Privacy Village tweeted on Thursday afternoon that Patreon had laid off their entire security team. In a follow-up tweet... She pointed to a LinkedIn post from Emily Metcalf, a former now Patreon employee, that said that she and the rest of the Patreon security team were no longer with the company and she was looking for work. Patreon's U.S. policy head Ellen Satterwhite told TechCrunch that Patreon had laid off five members of its internal security team. It did not deny that that was the entire security team, but it also didn't clarify how many people were on that team. Uh, she also told TechCrunch that Patreon works with external organizations to, quote, develop our security capabilities and conduct regular security assessments. So, like a lot of companies, 
they've got a contractor. They've got an outside company providing this. Uh, that is all that anyone outside of Patreon actually knows. Now, Rob and I will get to the things that we can have educated guesses about. First of all, uh, not all, but most of PayPal's uh, or Patreon's financial security concerns are handled by outside vendors like PayPal. That's why I accidentally said PayPal just then, uh, because PayPal, Stripe, and other payment proce processors shoulder a lot of that. Uh, that's not atypical for, for a lot of companies out there. So if your first reaction was that your payment information was going to be under threat, it is likely not. Yeah, and that leaves all the personal data that Patreon does manage, like name, email addresses, and mailing addresses, among other things. And it likely includes some payment account info, though not payment processing. This, however, does not mean that Patreon has no one running its security. It's likely using something like a managed security service provider or MSSP. In other words, they outsourced it. We're in the realm of guessing now, but it's fair to guess that one of the C-level executives who manages security and feels confident in their role uh, has decided that they want to increase in, uh, you know, you know, availability and decrease cost. Your mileage may vary on whether you think an MSSP is better, worse, or equal to an in-house team. And this is a classic on-prem versus off-prem question, which enterprise tech folks uh, are very familiar with. I can tell you myself, I am intimately familiar with this because I have been on both sides and have managed from both sides of this. So, Tom... Does this bother you? Yeah, uh, a, l a little. It doesn't bother me for a lot of the reasons I see people with their hair on fire uh, talking about. I'm, I'm not worried that Patreon has just you know left all the gates open uh, and they're like, no, we don't need security anymore. I, I think they're a little smarter than that. Uh, I am not even worried that they, they contracted it out. Uh, there are a lot of companies that do MSSP or something like it. Uh, and in, in some cases, it can increase your security because you get somebody who's better at it than your internal team would have been. I'm not saying that's the case with Patreon. I don't know, but I'm just saying that can happen. So just the fact that they're doing something like that doesn't bother me. What does bother me is the lack of communication around it. Not necessarily in advance. Companies change up what they do internally and, and what external contractors they use all the time without having to talk to the public. But once it went on Twitter, to be uh, so tight-lipped about it uh, seems like it leaves room for misunderstanding. Uh, you're talking about security here. Reassure me uh, that you've got a very reliable solution for this. Uh, and we're not hearing that. that. That's where I'm at. I would like to hear more about why this isn't a problem. I'm not jumping to the conclusion that it is, but it's important to me that it not be. But I'm curious where you stand on this, Rob, because like you said, you've been involved in these exact kind of situations. So, um, you know, IT outsourcing, it, it, this is an enormous business. This is how a lot of businesses run. So, you know, I'm not going to say it's a good thing or it's a bad thing. I, I've seen it be good in many uh, organizations. I've seen it be not so good in other organizations. Um, I've seen, um, you know, just, just both sides of this from, from a, you know, how you manage it and everything. What's a little interesting, though, here is, as you said, they probably should have had a better PR response to this or they should have had something prepared. But knowing that, well, if you just fired folks, those folks are free and clear. They're going to go talk mm -hmm. about whatever they want to talk about, however they want to talk about it. They should have been more prepared for that. And what I have seen, um, you, usually when you have an organization that's going to take something that was internal and then they outsource it, a lot of the employees that were internal now, they, they no longer work for you, but they often go and work for the contractor because you want to keep all of that knowledge as close to, you know, um, as, you know to in-house or in, in this case, outsource as possible. So it doesn't necessarily look, I mean, we don't know that th that's not happening or there may, they may not have gone back and hired everyone except for the person mm -hmm. that we heard from on LinkedIn. But it just doesn't have a good look. And from from my experience, if you're not keeping at least some of those folks around, um, you know, as contractors, because they have all of that knowledge, um, you may run into hiccups. So I'm really interested to just to look at and see how this thing plays out over time, because once again, this is their security they cannot be joking around with this stuff. No, absolutely not. And uh, and it, it just leaves a lot of questions uh, and, and a lot of room for misunderstanding. And when you leave room for misunderstanding, the Internet is going to misunderstand it in the worst possible way. That's mm -hmm. that's just the nature of, of what we see out there. So so I try to be more even handed and look at this and say, all right, there are people within Patreon that have been involved with security 
that were not part of this team anymore. So they've got a little bit of institutional knowledge within. Like you say, did they keep some people that have that institutional knowledge that weren't on this team? Did they transition some of this team over to contractors? And maybe they didn't tell everybody because the contractor didn't want to hire everybody. It didn't sound like there was a reputation for that team being bad. So I don't assume they got rid of them because they weren't good at their jobs. It really does seem like an availability and cost thing, like 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 you said, availability meaning a contractor will be available twenty four seven because they have lots of people and mm -hmm. lots of resources versus a smaller internal team. Well, you got to let them sleep. You know, you you can't work them all the time. Yeah, and like I said, they, they, there are times when you know people are going to like, well, contracting is bad, and it's not because and it often is the case if they only had a five person team and they go to a contractor that this is what they do. There may be and probably will be significantly more knowledge there. Just people have seen and done more things when they have been around yep. more environments to see and have done more things in. So I don't want to initially just jump to the side that this is a bad thing. Um, we just don't know. What we do know is that Patreon should have, as I said earlier, had a much better response to this and have been prepared for this because you had to see this company. They're very, they're a very public company. You know, um, you know, not publicly traded, but just a public company as far mm -hmm. as perception in, in in this arena. And you know that people are going to be talking about this. And it's not their first rodeo at a public backlash, right? Like right. they've had backlashes over all kinds of things uh, <laughs> in have. the past. So, uh, I I am not. Uh, canceling my Patreon account. Uh, I, I, I'm not uh, seriously concerned. Uh, I would like more information. Uh, and I, I expect that will be forthcoming. And they're just being very careful about uh, putting that message out there. I would also recommend that those five people on that, that got laid off, uh, y'all should, should get together and, and, you know, form a little paper LLC company and be ready to do some consulting in, in the, in the future, uh, and, and get a little cash back out of Patreon when they come knocking at your door and need something. <laughs> Cause they might. They very you, well you never that I've seen that happen before. That mm. that is not a novel idea. That that has actually <laughs> happened before. All right, let's talk air taxis. So United Airlines has invested fifteen million dollars into Eve Air Mobility, which makes four seat electric vertical takeoff and landing or EV tall aircraft. United also ordered 200 of the air taxis with an option for another 200. The first of the aircraft will arrive in 2026 at the earliest. United cited Eve's relationship with trusted aircraft builder Embraer as one of the reasons it decided to make the deal. With this deal added to the 100 EV tall aircraft United ordered last month from a different company, it will end up with a fleet of 300 to 500 electric air taxis. Eve's EV tall aircraft has fixed wings, rotors, and pushers with a range of 60 miles. United notes that it makes 90% less noise than conventional aircraft. So Tom, I want to know if big ballers like you are going to be flying around to the airports <laughs> like this in the future. Oh man, I would love that. Uh, it's really going to depend on the price. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I know we've got uh, some nice uh, helicopter infrastructure here in, in Los Angeles, in the Los Angeles area. So availability should be all right. Uh, I do think what we're looking at is United creating a system to get you to the airport faster. Uh, they're talking about craft with a range of 60 miles. So they're not going to be flying between cities here. Uh, they're talking about crafts that make 90% less noise. They push that because when they fly them over your house, they don't want you upset uh, and, and think you're going to get a bunch of aircraft noise uh, all over the place because they want to fly these things back and forth between populated neighborhoods and the airport. Uh, if this ends up being viable, if United makes a go of it, if other airlines follow suit, I would expect that uh, this could, in five years or so, be a new way you get to the airport. I'm hoping it's affordable enough for me to consider uh, cause right now I'm looking at sometimes a 90 minute drive to get to LAX. I used to live really close to it and I love that, but I don't anymore. Uh, and if traffic's bad, it, there's just no other way to get there, right? Whether you pay mm -hmm. a little bit for a bus, whether you take an Uber, whether you drive yourself, it takes a long time. And this would cut that down quite a bit. I was never a road warrior in my, in, in you know, my corporate IT days to the point mm -hmm. to where I was regularly taking, you know, helicopters from you know from rooftops to the airport but i have done it you know a time or two or three 
And the reason for it is simply because in places like L.A., in places like D.C., in places like Chicago, um, New York, you just can't get to the airport in time to catch your flight. Um, you know, or in time to, you know, to make a fight or whatever the case is, these are the only ways that you can do it. And it seems like it's really expensive, but depending on how important that call was Mm -hmm. and what level you are at a company, you just have to get to where you can get to, um, to be, my gut tells me these are not going to be the people who are flying coach. They're going to be using these at first and maybe not even the folks who are going to be flying on commercial air. And what my gut tells me is a lot of this is going to be people who are using something like net jets and they literally, they've got three flights they've got to make in a day and they've got to get back and forth from where they are to the airport where they can take off as quickly and expeditiously as possible. Um, that's where the helicopter surfaces are used. And if these things are 90% more quiet than helicopters, because that's probably what they're talking about, mm-hmm. now they're going to be able to potentially go into, well, we're going to land behind the high school. We're going to land in that park. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think you're going to start seeing laws and stuff like that will allow these things to happen because these are small aircraft, but they're not making that noise. So you can actually fly them over residential areas. Uh, only one of us has ever taken a helicopter to the airport on this particular show right now. So I'm, I'm expecting you're probably right that this, this is certainly going to be increased capacity for private travel, possibly limited capacity for, for commercial. Uh, and what I hope is that it might get down to the, to the comfort plus level, uh, rather than the, uh, the first class uh, level and and then it might be something I could take it or or at least get to the point where you're not going to take it every time you go to the airport but there there will be those situations where you're like okay I'm gonna I'm gonna splash out for this because I really have a tight schedule or it's a special occasion or or, or something like yeah. that and, and this won't be for vacation travel remember these are only four seaters and you yep. can't take you know 300 pounds of luggage with you That's uh, you know on this is is basically for four people and probably a bag. <laughs> Mm-hmm. A bag. So, um, like I said, I'm I'm excited just to see it because I, you know, you know, anything that gets us closer to the Jetsons is is, is good in my book. Yeah, and we've been we've been talking about electric. Uh, well, we've t- been talking about VTOL for for decades now, uh, and we've been talking about electric VTOL, which is you know going to use electricity, so low emissions and and all of that. Uh, we've been talking about that for for years and years now too. So it's nice to see these sorts of plans get real orders uh, and and move a little bit towards viability. Uh, I know we got pilots, Brian, uh, others uh, out there in the audience. So if you have thoughts on this, give us an email or join in the conversation in our Discord. You can join that by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. The conversation has an article called Doom Scrolling is Literally Bad for Your Health. Here's four tips to help you stop by Australian Research Fellows and Digital Childhoods Kate Manlin and in tech communication policy James Meese. They describe doom scrolling as overconsumption of bad news. And while you probably assume that is not great for you, there's research that indicates it's actually bad for you. <laughs> yeah, uh, this that part may not surprise you, but uh, it's nice to have the science on it. A study published in the journal Health Communication uh, that is called Caught in a Dangerous World, Problematic News Conception and Its Relationship to Mental and Physical Ill-Being uh, found, and I quote from the study, greater mental and physical ill-being among those with higher levels of problematic news consumption. So there there was definitely a relationship. Uh, they argue that it's not a problem to be a news junkie. Uh, you just need to know your limits. To quote from the study, it is not the amount of news that one consumes that is problematic so much as the nature in which it is consumed. Uh, and as an example of that, let's bring in another study published July 2020 about people doom scrolling during COVID. It was in European Archives of Psychiatry and Clinical Neuroscience. They found that people who checked news about COVID seven or more times a day for a total of two and a half hours of exposure had greater symptoms of anxiety and depression. So it wasn't the amount, it was the frequency, it was the total time spent on a particular topic. And there are also similar studies that found similar things related to the Boston Marathon bombing, the events of September 11th, 2001. So that part isn't new. Mantle and Reese surveyed people in Victoria and have identified four tips that people commonly say to help them to stop. It's worth noting that none of the recommendations involve being uninformed. They try to balance being informed with being overwhelmed. So let's take a look at those and talk about how we think they might work for us. So the first mm-hmm. one here, um, this one is something, you know, I didn't read this article and start doing this. This is something I kind of started doing my, on my own, but it is to set a time 
to check news rather than checking it periodically throughout the day. For me, it was not so much news. It was TikTok and Instagram. I would just mm-hmm. be sitting down, uh, you know, pull my phone out and wow, where did the 40 minutes go? So I could absolutely see that if you're looking at negative news or you're just looking at things that just bother you to your core, if you're just doing that over and over and over again, how that could be somewhat problematic for you. Yeah, I, I do this uh, myself. Uh, I have a time in the morning. I'm a morning paper kind of person. Although they, they say in this article, some people may not want to start the news in the morning because it might ruin your day. Uh, mm-hmm. So do what's best for you. But But I have a time in the morning that I look at the news. And I look at what's going on in that day. I also have a thing on my Amazon Echo uh, that plays in the morning, a you know five-minute newscast of world events. Uh, and that is the way I make sure to be caught up. And then I don't watch television news at all anymore. I don't, uh, I don't look at any kind of television news. And I generally don't read any other news the rest of the day that isn't related to my job. Tech news is a whole different thing. I'm obsessively checking that every morning in mm-hmm. preparation for the show. But that's fairly well s- separated uh, from, from the rest of the news. So for, for, for just general news, I follow that one very closely. So, Tom, the, the second tip here is to avoid news notifications um, and other ways that news is pushed to you as compared to you going out and actually checking for it. This one is huge because I know me when I had the, you know, the Twitter notification and I had the Facebook notification. And I was getting WhatsApp messages all the time and Telegram messages all the time. It is kind of like, you know, ooh, look, but bubbles and butterflies. As soon as something pops up, you kind of if you have your phone, you look at it and then you're sucked in. Mm-hmm. Um, and my reason for doing this was just trying to be more productive. But if you are getting sucked into just, you know, depressing type of news um, at any time that it happens, that's probably not, you know, according to this research is not the best way to do it. So if you can turn off those notifications, you know, you'll probably actually, you know, do yourself a bit of good. You definitely can help improve some of your productivity. I am a big fan of declaring notification bankruptcy. Just turn off all your notifications, maybe except for SMS, right? Or, or something like that where you're like, I know I absolutely need that one. Turn them all off and then see which ones you actually miss and turn those back on. Uh, you'll find that you are much calmer uh, and that you didn't need most of the stuff your phone was throwing at you. I also personally, and this is this is not something that may be right for everybody, I don't follow news sources on Twitter I don't really even use Facebook, but I, I don't follow it on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or any of them. Uh, I, I follow individual voices with a, a, a kind of a, an aim of, of getting a representative sample of people's opinions on things and entertainment and funny stuff. Uh, but I don't follow news. And, and I hear people talking about like, well, I use Twitter for news. I do not. Uh, for, for this very reason, like I, I, that's why I tend to end up seeing people reacting to things versus seeing the thing itself when it's on Twitter. I too stopped using Twitter for news. In fact, uh, it's funny that we're doing this, you know, this uh, story today, probably over the last week or 10 days, Mm. I've probably deleted about 50% of the accounts that I follow on Twitter and and anything that was a news site, you know, MSNBC, CNN, all that kind of stuff, because I actively will go and watch CNN when I want to watch CNN. I'll actively go watch, you know, Fox when I want to watch Fox. I'll, you know, I I, I actively set time aside to go do that. I don't need them to, you know, to notify me, hey, here's new news. Come, you know, come, uh, you know, look at it. But once again, it wasn't for the same reasons as in this study, but I can see how just not getting those notifications can absolutely help with this if those kind of stories are bringing you down just because of the amount of the consumption that you have. Yeah. Again, it's it's that it, the first two are all about make sure to access the news on your terms, not pushing it in front of you. So the third uh, item here is make it harder to get the news so that you don't mindlessly start checking it, such as moving all social media and news apps to a folder that is not on the home screen of your phone. I I mean, I actually kind of do this, but not for this reason. I do have all my news apps in a folder, uh, but I have everything in a folder. And the only things on my home screen uh, are, are like camera, SMS, like really utilitarian stuff. I don't have any content stuff there anyway. This one doesn't really apply to me because I don't need it. Uh, but this this feels like a thing if you're like, yeah, but I'm having a hard time resisting the impulse. I'm just in the habit. Uh, then then you might want to do that to just kind of to help break yourself of the habit. Yeah, so I'm, I'm an Android user, so I'm really into the aesthetic of how my screen looks, where I've got yeah. all these kind of widgets and, you know, and folders and this and that and the other. So I'm like you, Tom. They were never there. The, the, you know, the real issue for me was just the notifications of them being there 
or uh, the folders where when you would get a message, you would actually see the folder change colors or you would get a, you know, a check mark in the folder, something like that. I have since turned all those kind of things off. So this wasn't a big one for me. But if you are that person where you've got Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and uh, TikTok as icons right there on your home screen and you're seeing them all the time and you don't want to see them all the time, maybe you should actually, uh, you know, move them, you know, into a folder or just move them to another page. You, you know, it, it might actually help. Yeah. And it, it, like you say, it, it's going to make your home screen look better. <laughs> so and then the fourth one here is to tell other people what you're doing so that they can help you maintain your limits. Now, here's what I'm thinking. If you got to go tell other folks, hey, uh, I'm really trying to cut back on my news and you're telling this to people so that they can help you do it. You may have actually had a problem. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that is something a little different to me to where I've got to go and say, hey, Tom, just want to let you know. I'm pulling back from my news uh, content, so make sure you're not doing anything to send me anything that might make me go look at Twitter. Yeah, um, yeah. I, that I one feel like is a little special. Yeah, th this one, I, I, I can imagine this applying to my sister-in-law because she lives with her father, uh, and he's a news junkie. So I could see it, it, somebody in that household saying like, hey, don't come talk to me about the news. I'm trying to cut down. I'll bring it up if I'm willing to talk about it. But but it could be a thing where someone in your household is like, hey, did you hear? Did you see the latest thing? Uh, and and you're like, I, I, I'm, I'm actually trying to, to, to not get all anxious about that stuff. So don't bring it up to me. Communication. It's, it's always about communication. I, I would add a fifth one here before we move on. Uh, find, say, a half hour podcast that uh, can just consolidate all the news for you and explain it in a half hour every day. Say, a, wh whatever kind of news you're looking for, say a daily, let's say you're into tech, like a daily tech news show, uh, and then just, just use that for your news time. Yeah? You like that idea? I, I kind of like that. Yeah. yeah. You could even go to a weekly tech show. Too, I was going to so, say, yeah. There, or, or, yeah, there could be a, <laughs> so weekly, a weekly tech with show three too. people <laughs> yeah, <laughs> called the Tech John. You know, just... Picking a name out of somewhere. Uh, folks, if you travel in a wheelchair, uh, Chris Christensen has a great tip uh, if you're looking to vacation in places with accessibility in mind. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. This is a story that caught my eye, and it seems pretty cool. For people who are disabled, there is a crowdsourcing technology project called the Accessibility Mapping System. And what this does is it's using volunteers all over the world to send in information about different destinations and how accessible they are. Their database has 200 different data points, like staff training, wheelchair accessibility, transportation logistics, braille signage, ramp access, and all sorts of other things. I am not an expert in the area, but I would send you to Curb Free with Corey Lee, who's a friend of mine who knows much more about this and has been able to travel all over the world in a wheelchair. The project, again, is the Accessibility Mapping System, and this is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Oh, thank you, Chris. Uh, that that is a great tip, and I know there's many people in the audience that'll that'll make good use of that. Uh, and and if you are in the audience saying, "Oh yeah, that's a good one," also this one, please send it along to us. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. But again, that was curb free with Corey Lee dot com. Let's check out the mailbag. Uh, David wanted to say he's really been enjoying listening to IAS on DTNS. He's a really knowledgeable journalist and the chemistry he shares with Sarah and, and myself uh, is obvious. Uh, he also really enjoys when we have the SMR podcast guys on too. So you, there you go, Rob. I know them. I know those guys. <laughs> you got a fan. Uh, he says, they are all excellent contributors, too. And I finally took Tom's advice and listened to their podcast. Unsurprisingly, it's excellent, too. Uh, this email was never meant to be a complete list of all the contributors that I like. So I'll just end here by saying that Justin continues to be great and showing my British bias. It'd be great if you had the host of Text Message uh, Nate Langson on again. Keep up the good work. Best wishes, David. I know it's been years, but I really enjoyed your EV roundtable with Allison and others. And if you're ever wondering if it's time for another one, my vote is yes. I don't own an EV and probably won't buy one in the next few years, but I'm interested in the area. Yeah, we might. We just might have to do that. Get ourselves uh, one of those new Ford Lightning owners like Chris Ashley. Huh? So we've got another one here, and this is in reference to DTNS 4350's discussion on iMessage not integrating with Android messaging. My family is split between both camps. It's normally not a problem, and I don't care about the bubble color. It's annoying that I can name uh, that I cannot name the group with my family members, but I don't 
or I, I can't live with that. The bigger issue is that SMS messages in that group do not appear on my iPad. Mm-hmm. Texts I send from my iPad don't get delivered to SMS users. At least at times where only part of the group receives a message. I don't think that makes uh, you know such a great experience for iPhone users. I just saw a story that Apple had become the majority phone maker in the U.S. It'll be interesting if iMessage begins to look anti-competitive with Apple's dominant position. Thanks, Don in St. Louis. Yeah, uh, if you're using a Wi-Fi only iPad, that that's all it can do. Uh, it you know it doesn't have a cellular connection. Uh, there is a way to bridge it, uh, I think. But if you haven't done that, uh, and sometimes that fails, uh, so yeah, it's it's gonna it's gonna only work within the iMessage universe. So and thank you. Don. I never I never thought about the anti-competitive nature mm-hmm. of this because now Apple they're the biggest now. That, in the that United just States, happened anyway. last week. So yeah, yeah you're in yeah. the United States. So that you know that that's a thing now. Uh, you know who is always pro-competitive is Len Peralta, uh, who has been illustrating today's show. Uh, Len, what have you drawn for us today? Am I pro-competitive? Uh, maybe I am. Um, you know, doom scrolling, bad. I know that. It's uh, it's mm-hmm. terrible. I'm uh, guilty of that as well. You know who doesn't like uh, doom scrolling a lot? Well, of course, it'd be Dr. Doom. Dr. And Doom. This is what this is. He's, <laughs> he doesn't really understand doom scrolling. He thinks people are scrolling about him. He's like, scrolling doom, bad for you. What did I ever do? Oh, right. I'm evil. <laughs> right, so, I'm uh, evil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dr. Is, uh, doom. It's in the name. Yeah. It is. It that is. is awesome. Dr. Doom. And, it, you know, I have, I had to scroll Dr. Doom when I was drawing this. So it's very interesting. Um, this, of course, if you're interested, it's uh, available on my <laughs> online store at uh, lenperaltastore.com. You can also get this right now if you are at uh, um, one of my Patreon users, patreon.com. <laughs> Talk about Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash Len. You can download it right now. Uh, hopefully nothing bad will happen, and I'm sure nothing bad will happen. So there you go. You also have that severance package over there. Did you catch the little severance blip <laughs> at the did. end of the Apple announcement? <laughs> I like, yeah, they're uh, leaning pretty hard on that. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Love uh, that. Rob Dunwood, thank you, my friend, uh, for being with here. Before we go, what else you got going on to tell folks about? Well, it's always a pleasure being here. And uh, I am one of the hosts of the before mentioned SMR podcast. And I'm also the host of a weekly tech show called The Tech John that, believe it or not, is a year old. It launched on DTNS Experiment Week. August of last year. So I think we're about to do episode 51. That's amazing. Uh, this coming Monday. Ah, I'm so glad it's still going and going strong, getting better all the time. I love that show. Glad to glad to do it, man. I'm glad I was kind of voluntold into that by <laughs> someone else who was on the screen right now. Uh, go <laughs> go check it out at the tech john j a w n dot com. Also, special thanks to Francis Bonamare, one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Thank you for all the years of support, Francis. Uh, you could be among the people thanked. Uh, brand new supporters and longtime supporters alike. So get on over there and support us. You get bonus shows. I did an editor's desk this week talking about conflicts of interest and what our policies are here at Daily Tech News Show. All kinds of good stuff like that. Roger's got a column, patreon.com slash DTNS. Of course, the biggest thing you get is the extended show, Good Day Internet. That's going to start right now if you're a patron. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com com slash live we'll be back on monday talk to you then this week's episodes of daily tech news show were created by the following people host producer and writer tom merritt host producer and writer sarah lane executive producer and booker roger chang producer writer and host rich straffolino video producer and twitch producer joe Kuntz. technical producer anthony lamos spanish language host writer and producer dan campos news host writer and producer jen cutter science correspondent dr nikki ackermans social media producer and moderator zoe detterding our mods beatmaster w scottis one biocow captain kipper steve guadarama paul reese matthew j stevens aka gadget virtuoso and jd galloway Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's show included Ayaz Akhtar, Terrence Gaines, Nika Monfort, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, Rob Dunwood, and Chris Christensen. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Time to 
Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>